Hi, this is Eric, and today we're going to be looking at round one of the Grand Chess Tour that was played in Croatia, in Zagreb. And the very first game featured a really interesting game. It was between Giri and Carlsen, and previously Carlsen had lost in under 30 moves with White to Giri a couple of years back. And uh, so it was interesting to see what Carlsen would play, playing for a win against Giri this time around. They always have interesting games, and the way Carlson has been playing very recently, it's very exciting to see whatever he does. So let's jump right into this. This one went e4, c5. Basically, Carlson signaled that he was going to go for his usual Sveshnikov, which he's been doing very well with. And he's been getting fighting, pl fighting positions, playable positions, um, different possibilities to outplay even 2750 players. Knight f3. Knight c6, bishop to b5. So Carlsen has recently been playing g6 in the World Championship match against Caruana last year. He played g6, bishop takes c6, d takes c6. In this game, he opted for e6. This was a popular move played by Gelfand in the 2012 World Championship match. So the core idea here is just to defend the knight on c6 with, with knight g7 and not allow the damaging of the pawn structure. So that's one of the main reasons why white usually takes on c6. So Carlson took back, b takes c6, capturing towards the center. One of the key points here is that is that a, a major part of black's strategy, in a bunch of different lines, black wants to try to play this sort of pawn structure where he gets to play e5 and has a potential of playing an f5 pawn break. Point being that black has the bishop pair and his unopposed bishop is the bishop on c8. So a lot of what the play revolves around here is black's ability to get that c8 bishop some type of play. And you'll see that in this game, in fact. So white played d3. Nice move, just simply consolidating, supporting e4. And also notice how this, in many cases, helps to lock out the, the, the uh, bishop on c8. Knight e7. So, Basically, one of Black's main plans is to go knight to g6, and if possible, to try to go d6, uh, e5 supported by d6. So this sort of central grip is exactly what Black is hoping to do if given the possibility. White plays h4, very nice move. Essentially, hoping to make the knight on g6 be in an unstable square where it will get chased away very quickly. So Black answers with h5 to secure that g6 square. And the main move played here is queen e2, but Geary played e5, also a perfectly principled move. Actually, right before I was about to start recording this video, a 2600 grandmaster said, was this d6 move played by Carlson just a bluff? It was just a bluff, wasn't it? I said, yes, I think it was. Um, the analysis that I did with both Leela and Stockfish was quite deep and confirmed the same thing. Basically, that structurally black is slightly worse. He has doubled and isolated sea pawns without sufficient positional compensation. But white needs to play accurately, and if black can lead play down some, some interesting lines, then he may be able to justify it. So basically, he's justifying damaging his own pawn structure slightly. The main move here has been traditionally to play f6, and part of the point of this is to try to take on e5 and... Basically, to have two central pawns versus one in the center, chase the knight away, and then try to play e5. So he played he played the move uh, d6. He takes d6. Notice how black now has three isolated pawns on the queen side, doubled and isolated c pawns. It's very hard to actually fully justify this. So I was expecting something like knight f5 now. White could just play knight bd2. He played knight g6. An interesting move. So he's keeping an eye on this h4 pawn. He's keeping an eye on the f4 square. In some cases, he may want to play e5, also restricting white's pieces quite a bit. So um, now knight fd2 is played. This is an interesting move. Another typical move here might be to play knight bd2, keeping open the option of playing aggressively with the knight. For example, coming to g5 in many cases can be a really interesting idea for white as well. So... And also when the knight comes to g5, it can later come to e4. So knight g6. So knight fd2. This is actually not a bad move. It, there's actually nothing really major to criticize about it. It's a perfectly sound move. And notice that the knight on h... If the knight coming to h4 to take the h4 pawn here, 
if you play something like this, notice that the h5 pawn is always loose behind it. So potentially a move like g3 can just win back that pawn on, on h5. So bishop takes d6 was played, and um, now Geary played knight c4. And uh, another way to play could just be to play something simple like knight c3 and g3, simply defending the pawn and trying to make black prove the justification for his slightly unusual play. So anyway, knight c4 was played, and black played bishop e7, not giving up the bishop pair here. So the, the plan was eventually to try to challenge this knight on c4, basically by playing bishop a6 and trying to take it. And otherwise, it's, it is somewhat hard to see what to do with that bishop on c8, so that, that plan does make perfect sense. So knight c3 was played. I was thinking that perhaps the most reasonable plan might, might have just been to play g3 and castle. g3, queen d5, castles. That looks like a very natural plan. So knight c3 was played. Black played bishop to a6, continuing the plan of challenging this, this c4 knight. So queen f3 was played. And now we have an interesting moment because the c6 pawn is attacked and um, black actually doesn't even need to defend it. That's the funny part. So he takes with check and black just plays king to f8. You might wonder, well, what's the king doing here on f8? Well, the point is that we can actually just take the pawn on, on h4 and later we can play knight f5, we can play g5, and the king will actually be perfectly safe on g7. Notice how white doesn't have any pieces over there to attack him. So he's perfectly safe on that side of the board. So white did take some positional risks by going for this plan because notice that now that knight takes h4 was played, by the way, this wasn't a loss of a pawn for black, it was just trading pawns. So actually black's pawn structure in some cases can even be preferable here just because white has the, the double pawns. It's true that black does have two isolated pawns, but they're not really capable of being attacked, and that's quite important now. So white decided to castle. So one of the first things that I thought of when I saw this game is that a lot of white's problems were caused by his poor queen position. His queen later went to, to a4 in a couple of moves, and his pieces just looked very, very clumsy. So a simple consolidating move here would have been the move queen to e4. So, for instance, just playing queen e4 here looks like a good natural move. And um, you can later castle, play b3, and uh, everything is much more easily consolidated. So, castling was played, and now black played knight to f5. Also quite natural. And uh, another way to play, he could have also played rook c8, chasing the queen away. He played that on the next move. So, the point of playing, the point of playing knight to f5 is is one of the options is to go knight to d4. So you might wonder, what's was the point of white's next move knight to e2? Well, the point is to cover that d4 square. So d4 is definitely a concern, but my thinking here is that, well, if that's actually a concern, why don't we just go queen to e4? And if they play something like this, then now rook to d1 is quite a nice move. And one of the problems that black faces here is how to deal with the rook d7 idea in the near future. For instance, if queen b6, I actually like the move. Um, I actually like the move a4, and one of the ideas can be to go rook to d7. We also have ideas of playing a5. So this looks like a pretty good way to play with white, and and really does like for example a6 rook to d7. Basically asks black what what is the core point behind your strategy because I'm covering everything. Everything's under control. Even if the knight hops into d4, it can be chased away in the near future. So. This seems like would have been a better way to, to play and a better way to handle the queen because the main problem that white had in the game is that his king got attacked and he just had simply no pieces nearby to defend. And with the queen, so you'll see what happens. The queen goes to no man's land, essentially. So rook c8, queen a4. And I think this is just simply a bad move. It's one of those cases of a move in which we can just call it a bad move without any special calculation, simply because... The queen is just way out of play here. Why not go queen to e4? So if queen to e4, black can play g5 and continue not only gaining space on the king side, in which he can do that without any risk, but also he frees a square for his king. So if something like this, let's say something like bishop to e3, now we can just go h4. So here I think we're very, very comfortable with this type of plan. 
And, I mean, black has many ideas. One idea can be to play something like queen to b6. We're threatening the pawn. We can try to go queen c6, trade queens. Looks like black's going to have a better end game there. So, um, you know, even at this, even at this stage, it was still, it, it was still quite important to make sure that you're aware, at least, of what black is trying to do. So now rook c7 was played. This looked like a pretty good move. Just consolidates everything on the seventh rank. And now the queen just looks out of place on a4. It's, it's not doing anything purposeful there. So bishop to f4 was played. And now rook to d7. So simply defending the rook. And one of the problems here is that the, the bishop is quite insecure here. It can just be chased away by g5, demonstrating that it's on an unstable square. And it's about to get kicked back very, very soon. So c3, c3 was simply too slow. So actually here was one of those major moments in which white needed to think about something a little bit maybe more creative and out of the ordinary than just kind of the typical moves, for example, like c3. So the move I was thinking of here was to play knight to g3. And the point of this move is that it fights against the strong centralized knight on f5. So if knight takes g3, we can actually play f takes g3. And even though this doubles and isolates the g-pawns, this is one of those cases in which it's worthwhile to damage your own pawn structure. The point being that now, for instance, the g2 point is very easy to secure. It's very easy for white to play rook to f2 whenever he needs to, to just keep everything under control. And um, of course, as I said, it was very important to trade off the passive e2 knight for the active f5 knight. Now it's gonna be very hard actually for white to create some threats. Notice that the f file is now open, so white has a lot more activity. And even though he has doubled and isolated pawns on the g file, they're not particularly weak. They're not particularly easy to attack. Black has no actual focal points in attacking white's king. So everything's actually everything's actually quite defensible here. So even if something like, let's say, let's say h4, I can just go c3 now. And this is a much better way to justify the whole thing. And notice that the queen, the queen has a couple different paths back to defend. It could come back this way, could come back this way, so the queen will come back into play and and uh, white will not have any major problems with this king. So in the game c3 was played, this was unfortunately just a very slow move and now white encountered g5, a very strong move. And the problem is what does white's bishop actually do because it doesn't have a lot of great options and he decided to go for rook a to d1 to try to challenge the d7 rook while he could. The problem here is that now he, he encounters very serious problems on the long diagonal. So now rook takes d1, rook takes d1, queen to a8 was played. One thing you can see here is that there are some pretty serious threats actually, for instance to the, to the g2 pawn. So actually if bishop to e5 in the game bishop c7 was played, but if bishop e5 was played, a very nice move here is actually this move um, queen to e4. And one idea is if bishop takes h8, there's knight h4. It's already very hard to defend because if you play uh, f3, there's, there's queen takes e2 winning. So some very serious problems already at this stage. So black already has a winning position with this one simple queen to e4 move. So that was the problem already at this stage. This, this bishop is on an unstable square. It's chased away. And how exactly do you defend, do you defend the king? And black has this very simple undermining plan of h4 followed by h3. Once h3 is played, the light squares around white's king are simply indefensible. So in the game, well, in the game, everything came crashing down immediately. And he actually just decided to resign right away. He played f3. I mean, he played f3 to try to counter that plan of h3. And there really wasn't anything to do h3 and it's pretty surprising for a top grandmaster to stop the clocks this early in the game but what else can you really do so a very quick resignation from from giri a pretty pretty disappointing way to start the game start start the uh the first game of a tournament and uh as you can see i mean there's not much to actually do when you just look at this when you look at this light square complex in front of the king there's there's just not a whole lot that he can do to even try to defend Let's say he plays a move like knight to g3, trying to challenge this knight right here. Well, black can just play, black can just play knight to h4, 
and you can just see everything crumbles. The entire position crumbles right in front of White's king, so essentially the problem was, I mean, take a look at the final position. The bishop isn't really doing much on c7. The queen on a4 is completely out of play. The rook on d1 seemed to be doing something, but actually wasn't really targeting anything. And what we had was we have, th we have three things over here. We have three pieces attacking on the king side. We have the queen from a8, the knight from h4, and the pawn on h3 all kind of wreaking havoc over there versus essentially no defenders of the light squares. It's true that the knight is there and the bishop from c7 can defend backwards diagonally, but not really actually covering anything. So final outcome is that white lost what could be called a miniature. Basically, he neglected his, his queen position and eventually his king came under fire and there just weren't any pieces to defend. So a great start to the tournament for Magnus Carlsen. He now crosses the 2775 barrier, 2776. So we'll see how the rest of the tournament goes. This has been quite an exciting start to the tournament.